विनायक जी विनायक जी हाँ नमस्कार बोला नमस्कार नहीं आई हूँ सीन यू आई एम वेटिंग फॉर वन मिनट ओनली वन मिनट वी विल स्टार्ट गुड इवनिंग मिस्टर कुलकर्णी गुड इवनिंग Good evening, all. We will start the session. Uh, myself, C. M. Binay Kulkarni, 
and CMA Ashish Bhavsa welcome you all for the today's webinar that is the series of webinar on income tax. Our today's topic is income from salary. I welcome CMA Dr. Ashish Tate sir, Central Council member and chairman of direct taxation committee. I also welcome CMA Sriram Mahankariwa sir, chairman of WIRC for today's webinar. Now I will request CMA Shira Mahankari Vaji to share his view. Oh. Shira sir. Yes, good evening. Question Madhya Mohan Mala Pravin Karanjan Karan total agreement around 50 lakhs per hand Zaila Pajja sir. Good evening, all of you. Good evening. Respected uh, How? Ashish Thatte, sir, Chairman of Direct Taxation How? Committee of the Headquarter. Respected uh, speakers uh, for today's webinar on income from salaries. Internal, uh, Mr. Choksi, sir. Mr. Amish Shahane, who is going to take the further sessions on the series which we are going to take in the near future when all of us are uh, in the last quarter of this financial year and everybody is preparing to go ahead with the taxation part direct taxation related parts of his personal as well as his business entities or the corporate taxation matters it becomes more relevant that we should rather have such type of knowledge sharing, knowledge upgrading webinars so that the members can be keep abreasted about the direct taxation issues which we face while filing or while providing consultancy services to our clients. So in that direction, I think this is the very apt initiative of the Western India Regional Council. And I congratulate the Professional Development Committee as well as the CPD Committee of the Western India Regional Council for initiating this series of webinars. My humble suggestions to the speakers will be while going through the contents of the various topics which we are going to have, that is income from salaries, from business and profession, from house properties, other sources, capital gains, that is the basic four heads, five heads of the income, as well as TDS part, chapters uh, six, and uh, income tax assessments and refund and also clubbing, uh, clubbing provisions, taxation of individuals, virtual digital assets, taxation impact on corporate restructuring, faceless assessments and appeals. So that way it will be my request to members to kindly go through or throw some light on the taxation of NRIs. Because nowadays in every uh, area you find some somewhere some members or the some uh, uh, some of our clients require suggestions or consultancy services for the taxation of NRI people also. So the provisions of taxation related to NRIs must also be the part of this series on income tax. Without wasting the time of the speakers. I hand over the proceedings to Vinay Kulkarni, sir. I will be attending the this series as well as the all the series which are going to be uh, conducted on various days up to 25th of March. So I will certainly, since I am also in the practice of direct access only, so that way it will be also a learning platform for me. Thank you very much for the active participation of the members. I hope more and more members will take the advantage of this income tax series. 
थैंक यू सर थैंक यू श्रीराम सर नाउ आई विल रिक्वेस्ट सीएमए डॉक्टर आशीष सत्ते टू शेयर विद यू uh so good evening all i don't know how many devices i have logged in because um, there was some technical error at my end technical issues so i think i might have logged in with two three devices so kindly excuse me if that has happened uh am i audible kulkarni sir yes 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 so thank you so much uh, for uh, you know uh, taking uh, um, direct taxes committee into consideration for doing this series uh you know uh, i had a very deep, deep and very uh, wide thought that uh, if we keep on doing series like this which is exclusively on the direct taxes that will definitely help all of us all the professionals to look into various aspects of direct taxation because we as cmas both as a practitioners as well as non practitioners we take very less uh, efforts to know direct taxes unless we have some work with it because we have uh, you know maybe working of direct taxes or maybe while filing our own returns we understand what are all direct taxes which has been done and of course on the next day of budget we all become the direct tax experts like that but uh, besides that we don't put much efforts on the direct taxes however uh, i'm thankful to uh, nirmala sitaraman madam who has given us opportunity now to look after various aspects of direct taxation because of insertion uh, through uh, section 142 uh, related matters where in inventory valuation is a exclusive area granted to the uh cost accountant so i think practitioners will definitely look into various aspects of costing various aspects of direct taxation and uh, you know that should help us to know that uh towards you know getting more recognition under the direct tax act that is it act uh of course uh, as a institute uh, i have immediately called for a meeting this monday at new delhi Uh, of the direct tax committee wherein we will discuss these provisions which has happened two days back and uh, i rest be assured as a uh, chairman of direct tax committee we will be coming out with uh, some or other guidelines publications faqs uh, if possible meeting with the various commissioner principal commissioners to uh, educate them to tell them that uh, you know this is how you can use this provision of inventory valuation uh in various disputes which are pending before uh, those are assessments which are pending before them uh, i think you all are listening to direct tax and we have expert speakers also they can uh, throw more light on that i'm not that expert in the direct taxation as such our chairman sir i know he is also expert into direct taxation so he might be knowing uh, possibly can explain you in further detail what i am trying to say so uh, those disputes or those assessments which are pending will definitely tell um, uh, you know people at large uh, uh, that is principal principal commissioner including assessing officers everyone that they should pursue for uh, this kind of inventory valuation and secondly uh, it's a very good opportunity two way for the institute and cms in totality that um, uh, you know i mean one way you are getting connected with the direct tax department it department so you are very much going to work for them because this provision asks for you to work for them second is the exposure of cms to uh, various other legal entities because we are more or less as a cost auditor working with the entities uh, having registered with the mca under mca and having turnover more than 50 crore 100 crore as the case may be for table a table b like that of course many of uh, our uh, professional colleagues are working with the various other entities also but at large scale cost accountants are not working with other legal entities like trust or like llps or like partnership firms or even individual proprietors also for that matter because they will also require inventory valuation why not there will be a proprietorship having turnover of 5 crore 10 crore 1 crore 2 crore whatever it is if they are under assessment so they will also require to have the inventory valuation so all these people will come to know about the profession of cost and management accountants especially msmes when there are uh, things related to assessment comes up 
so it's a very good opportunity we feel that uh, with uh, we are having no stakes no exposure in income tax barring few things here and there are now going to have very good exposure in income tax uh, act it act as such and uh, in, in person i would like to thank uh, dr bhagwat karad uh, to whom i met 4 weeks back uh, in new delhi and appraised him about uh, you know the happenings at the institute uh, our professional development as well as environment which has come actually frankly speaking uh, we have told him that uh, you know the inventory valuation should be added along with the tax audit itself so in the tax audit what is the inventory which is valued should be given by the cost accountant that was our proposal that was our discussion with him however it came through 142 as a assessment so that is fair enough we feel that whatever we got is good enough and we will also try for the inclusion of cost accountants in the um, accountant definition in future which is going on and of course we'll keep on trying so let us hope with this uh, uh, you know our exposure to direct taxes i congratulate uh, uh cms uh, ashish bhasar and vinay kulkarni sir uh, chairman of cpd and pd committees uh, those who have taken up this initiative they thought that you know you, you remember I, i mean you see this direct tax series they planned it long back one month or one and a half months back our mails were circulating amongst us to get the permissions and finalize the speakers and everything so this has not started after the last budget this has started uh, one one and a half months back and when they these people started we got some exposure in income tax also so these are lucky guys they are thinking about direct taxation so thankful to both of them uh, for uh, you know giving the uh, having thought that we should work something in the direct taxation and of course they both are led by very able uh, chairman of western india regional council uh, shriram sir Uh, who is always particular about so many things and always particular about uh, you know having sessions uh, uh, you know conducted on all the topics which uh, he has allowed us to conduct this uh, session on the uh, direct taxation also on the other hand we have a series of uh, microsoft excel advance uh, functions is also going on so these two series of wrc are going on very well and uh, i i you know i give my best wishes to uh, all the wrc team including staff for this series uh, i may not be attending all the sessions like what chairman sir mentioned that he will be attending all the sessions i may not be attending all the sessions due to some or other um, time constraints even today i may not be able to attend barring 5 minutes initially uh, but my best wishes are always with you and uh, i am very sure that uh, team well led by shri ram ji Ashish Bhav Sir and Vinayak Pulkarni Sir will take this series forward. If you have any uh, suggestions, queries, uh, or further topics for suggestion or etc. etc., you can definitely talk to them. We all are very much reachable to all of you, right? So thank you so much, and uh, I'm very sorry for bit delayed uh, due to some technical uh, hitch at uh, my end. Thank you so much. Uh, back to you, Pulkarni Sir. Thank you. Thank you, CMA Dr. Ashish Thakur Sir. now i will request shreme ashish bausa sir to introduce our today's speaker thank you gulkarni sir and thank you uh, ashish thakke sir and shreevram mahakaliwal sir for allowing uh, us uh, to uh, conducting this uh, direct income tax series and we have a uh, learned faculty with us uh, uh, cma dakshesh toksi sir and uh, cma amit sahane sir both are the speaker will lead this uh, income tax series and uh, taking the various topics of uh, uh, income tax both are, both the uh, faculties have a uh, uh, expert exposure in the income tax series today's our speaker is uh, cma doc uh, cma dakshesh choksi sir cma dakshesh choksi sir is a, a cost accountant chartered accountant and uh, become qualified he is a uh, Uh, all india rank holder in the cma intermediate examination he is also uh, qualified insolvency professional and he is being having a 3 years 3 uh, decades of extensive experience across the diversified range of services including corporate management corporate finance and resource mobilization financial reconstruction uh, restructuring and promoters equity fund legal and taxation he has a specialized in turnaround of stress business 
it provides an all rounded solution to the organization to create value addition from the research within he has written articles in professional journals as a uh, and has a conducted various lectures meeting on the subjects to professional interest his inner strength is to foresee what an entrepreneur face to do he is the founder uh, director of four strategy advisor private limited a special uh, a situation resolution entity helping seek and potential seek units to revive he has carried out debt restructuring exercise including cd cdr for a large cap- uh, corporates having a debt size ranging from 100 cr to 400 cr his uh, his exposure in this uh, in, uh, income tax has been also uh, he being a practicing chartered accountant he has also doing uh, practice of uh, direct taxation also he is a active uh, member of amdavad uh, chapter and currently he is a vice chairman of amdavad chapter of cost accountant i welcome uh, dakshes choksi sir for today's session and i am sure with expertise of uh, his as well as amit sahane sir we will definitely get the good knowledge of uh, direct tax particularly income tax uh, under uh, during this whole series so now i request dakshes choksi sir to take over this session ahead dakshes sir over to you and before that i request all the members to mute their mic and uh, close the camera so that we can uh, 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 comfortably un- uh, under- uh, understand the uh, speaker's view as well as his voice and uh, presentation thank you very much dakshes sir over to you yeah So just a minute. I will request all the participants to fill the Google form for CEP attendance. So over to you. Very good evening, friends. First of all, I would like to give my hearty compliments to WRC and in particular to Dr. Ashish Thate, Chairman Direct Tax Committee, CMA Shreya Mahalvilkar, Chairman of WRC. CMA Vinay Kulkarni, Vice Chairman, CMA Ashish Tawsar, uh, Secretary, and CMA Chetanya Mohare, Treasurer, for coming out with this webinar series on direct taxes. It's a budget season for professionals like us. Lot of budget sessions are going around, and I am the Vice Chairman of our chapter. And while I am taking this lecture today, is budget session is going on at my amdavad chapter also so amidst the budget season we are now coming out we are starting this direct tax series that's a good part this series is spread over 8 weeks total 13 lectures and i feel that it is a good idea to start the series with a relatively simpler relatively easy topic like income from salaries friends as i deal more in corporate restructuring i hardly get the time to refresh myself with the provisions of income from salaries this session has provided me an opportunity to refresh myself and to update my knowledge so with this background uh, i would like to start my session i think today sessions is timings is from 6 to 8:30 and from tomorrow onwards we have got the session from 5 to 7:30 so from tomorrow onwards will be we are going to end the session at 7:30 and as i said the topic income from salaries is relatively easier and simpler topic and i feel that we should be able to finish today's session little bit early Ashish, how can I share my uh, screen? It's there. Sir, there is a share option. Now it's visible. It's visible, no? Yes, yes. Fine. So, income from salaries. the chapter income from salaries start with three sections that is section 15 section 16 and section 
Section 15 speaks about the basic of charge. That is any salary due, whether paid or not. Any salary paid, whether due or not. And any areas of salary paid. Section 16 speaks about deductions. There is standard deductions, entitlement tax and professional tax. And section 17 defines the salary. Like salary includes wages, annuity, pension, oh, gratuity, oh. fees, commissions, perquisites, oh, okay. profits in lieu of salary, advanced salary, leave encashment, and taxable portion of PF. Okay. So first of all, we'll understand the chargeability of salary. So salary is chargeable to tax either on due basis or on receipt basis, whichever is earlier. That means that if the salary is due, whether you receive it or not, it becomes chargeable to tax. Another, yeah, one child is there. Can you please ask to mute everybody? The for charging as a salary under the head income from salaries, the relationship of employer and employee is a must. Without the relationship of employer and employee, the income cannot be charged under the head income from salaries. This relationship as an employer employee can be part time or can be full time. We see number of professionals working on a part time basis with more than one employer. So salary income from all these employers from more than one employer will be clubbed together and will be chargeable under the head salary. So it's not necessary that salary from only one employer would be subject to uh, chargeability under the head salary. Salary received or due from present, past or future employer is also taxable under this head. Another important factor is tax-free salary. As a rule, the tax on the income is required to be borne by the person who is earning the income. Some corporates come out with the concept of tax-free salary. So in such cases, tax borne by the employer on salary will also be considered as a part of the salary. Salary in lieu of notice period is also chargeable under this head. Salary due in a previous year is taxable whether it is received or not during that previous year. Likewise, salary received in advance during the previous year is taxable even if it is not due. Receipts from persons other than employer would not be taxable under the head salaries. If you are acting in two capacities, one in the capacity as an employer employee and another where this relationship is missing, then such income would not be taxed under the head salaries, but it would be taxed under the head income from other sources. Another important idea is place of accrual. It will be the place where the services are rendered. Like we said the main fundamental is the relationship as an employer and employee. So salary as a partner is not taxable under the head salaries. Likewise, areas of salary, it is taxable in the year in which it is received. Suppose if I receive areas of salary of a past financial year, then it will not be taxed in the past year, but it will be taxed in the current year. Now, due to such an earning of past year in the current year, it may happen that my tax lab gets changed. So in such a case, the SAC can apply to income tax officer for claiming relief under section 1891. Another important aspect is once salary has been earned, it becomes taxable, though subsequently the employee decides to waive the same because the waiver is treated as application of the income. Likewise, loan taken by the employee is not taxable. So we need to understand the difference. As I said earlier, advanced salary is taxable. But advanced against salary would take the nature of the loan. 
so the advance against salary would be treated like a loan and would not be taxable whereas the advance receipt of the salary is taxable under the head income from salaries as is said section 15 speaks about basic of charge any salary due the the focus is on due from an employer or former employer whether paid or not second aspect is any salary paid by an employer whether due or not third aspect is any area of salary is paid if it is not taxed in earlier years then all these three things would be fall under the basic of charge and would be taxable as i said relationship of employee and employee is a must and the accounting method employed by the employee is irrelevant in this case section 16 standard deductions up to 50000 entertainment tax and professional tax in the budget we have seen that now standard deduction is also available under the new tax regime components of salary there can be various components of the salary basic salary dns allowance advance salary arrears of salary leave and cash mind salary in lieu of notice fees and commissions linked to the performance or linked to the turnover whatever bonus gratuity pension contribution to the provident fund remuneration for extra work or any other voluntary payments by the employer so this different components can have different tax treatment like basic salary and dns allowance are always taxable advance salary or arrears of salary is also taxable bonus payment is taxable at the time of payment if it is not tax early on the due basis fees commissions overtime payments other voluntary payments all are taxable allowances are taxable unless exempted as per the respective provisions and the retired benefits gratuity pension is exempt as per the respective provisions now salary two things are uh, very important one is the basic salary basic salary and basic fundamentals another are the various allowances which an employee gets and the third would be the perquisites so firstly we will understand the allowance so what is an allowance an allowance is the financial benefit given to the employee by the employer over and above the regular salary these benefits are provided to cover particular expenses whether personal or for discharge of duties for example convenience expenses paid to food expenses incurred for commuting to workplace some of these expenses are taxable under the salary a few of them again could be partly taxable and few others can be non taxable or fully exempt from taxes so we'll understand this this allowances one by one dns allowance is fully taxable dns allowance can be in two parts as per the terms of the employment one forming part of the salary another not forming part of the salary as a tax planning purpose you should ensure that dns allowance always forms part of your salary because this will help to minimize the tax incidence on hra gratuity commuted pensions and will also reduce the tax impact on employer's contribution to the provident fund other fully taxable allowances are overtime allowance like if you work overtime the company would pay overtime so that is fully taxable another is ct compensatory allowance ct compensatory allowance is paid to employees in urban center which may be highly expensive and this is paid to cope up with the inflated living cost in the cities so this is also fully taxable in team allowance when an employer gives an interim allowance in lieu of final allowance this becomes fully taxable once when it is paid 
project allowance certain companies pay project allowance if you are working on some project then some special allowance is attached to that project this is also fully taxable tiffin meals allowance then cash allowance then non practicing allowance like uh, this happens in medical professions when physicians are attached to clinical centers they are paid non practicing allowance because then they are not allowed to do practice same thing is for the warden institute warden allowance servant allowance fixed medical allowance so whenever the word comes allowance mostly it would be taxable unless specifically exempt or allowed house rent allowance is one of the major factor for calculating the house rent allowance the salary will include basic salary and da and commission so that's why i said if da is forming part of salary then it will help you to reduce the taxability of house rent allowance to avail this benefit it's necessary that employee has incurred the expenses towards the house rent if the employee is staying in his own house self owned house then he cannot claim house rent allowance for calculating the liquidity only the basic salary da which is due advance salary will not be considered for the exemption amount the calculation is very simple house rent allowance rent paid less than percent of the basic salary then 50% of the salary if you are in metros and 40% for other cities and actual hra received the list of the three would be exempt this is all what we have studied during our uh, as a student life special allowances can be of two types one special allowance which is granted to meet expenses incurred for the performance of official duty another allowances are granted to meet personal expenses the allowances which are granted to meet expenses for the official duty are exempt to the extent spent for the purpose of official duty if such amount is not actually spent for official duty then the balance amount would be subject to tax whereas the allowances which is granted to meet personal expenses will be exempt as per the limit specified irrespective of the actual amount is spent or not so this is subject to this is subject to the provisions in the act where they said that this allowance will be exempt subject to these limits now we'll see various advances and its tax implications allowances to meet cost of packers and movers if uh, you are on a transferable job and the company moves you from one place to another and then you are required to spend on packers and movers for transporting your doc, your goods so this allowance to the extent you have spent actually incur the expenses would be exempt transport allowance for computing between office and residence is exempt subject to 1600 rupees per month another children education allowance is exempt to the extent of rupees 100 per month per child for a maximum of two children likewise hostel expenditure the limit is 300 rupees uniform allowance to the extent of the expenditure actually incurred so these are the basic allowances which i have gone through now most important aspect on the salary is perquisites section 172 of the income tax act defines perquisites perquisites would include value of rent free accommodation provided by the employer this can be completely rent free or at a subsidized rent value of any concession in the matter of rent respecting any accommodation provided to the ssc any sum paid by the employer in respect of an obligation which was actually payable by the employee so any expenditure which was supposed to be made by the employee and instead of that 
employer makes such a payment, then it is considered as a perquisite. Value of any benefit, amenity granted free or at concessional rate. The value of any specified security or split security equity shares allotted or transferred directly or indirectly by the employer or former employer free of cost or at concessional rate. Any sum payable by the employer, whether directly or through a fund, other than a recognized provident fund or an approved supervisor fund to effect an insurance on the life of the SSC. Next is the amount of any contribution to an approved supervision fund by the employer in respect to the SSC. The value of any other fringe benefit or amenity. Now, perquisites can be classified under three heads. Certain perquisites taxable in all cases. Certain perquisites are not taxable at all. Certain perquisites taxable only in the hands of specified employees. So now we will see these perquisites in parts. Perquisites can be of two types, non-monetary perquisites and monetary perquisites. Non-monetary perquisites are taxable only for specified employees, whereas monetary perquisites are taxable for all employees. Non-monetary perquisites include free domestic servant at home, free gas, electricity, water at home, free educational facility for children, use of company's motor car. Whereas monetary perquisites are reimbursement of salary of a servant. So if you fall under non-specified employee, instead of asking for reimbursement of salary, you should ask for the free domestic servant at home. You should ask for the free service instead of asking for the reimbursement of the expenses incurred by you. So in such a case, you would be out of the taxability. Like reimbursement of salary, reimbursement of bills, gas, reimbursement of school fees, reimbursement of motor expenses. So when the word reimbursement will come, it will become taxable for all employees. So as we said that certain, uh, certain items are taxable only for specified employees. So we need to understand what are the specified employees? What is the definition of specified employees? Specified employees is a person who is a director employee, <coughs> an employee who has substantial interest, that is beneficial owner of equity sales carrying 20% or more, and an employee whose monetary income under the head salary exceeds 50,000 rupees. So if you fall under these categories, then you would be classified as a specified employee. And in your case, non-monetary perquisites would also become taxable. Now let's see, first we see the value of rent-free accommodation is perquisites. So how the valuation of unfurnished rent accommodation is done. The value of perquisites will be treated as a 15% of the salary in cities having population of more than 25 lakhs. If it is uh, having a smaller city, then the limit can reduce to 10% and 7.5%. In case the accommodation provided is not owned by the employer, but is taken on lease or rent, then the value of perquisites would be the actual amount of lease rent paid or payable by the employer or 15% of salary, whichever is lower. In the first case, where we said perquisite is amount equal to 15%, the accommodation would be owned by the employer. In both the cases, if the company is charging any amount by of rent from the employee, the value of perquisites would be reduced by such a rent paid by the employee. Same way, value of furnished Rental accommodation, the value would be value of unfurnished accommodation as computed above in the previous slide. 
increased by 10% per annum the cost of the furniture if the furniture is higher from a third party then the higher charges paid or payable by the employer would be considered as a perquisite value and if any amount is recovered from the employee the perquisite would get reduced to that extent same way perquisite arising out of supply of gas electric energy or water this shall be determined as the amount paid by the employee to the agency supplying the same the expenditure incurred by the employer company would be added as your perquisite and if the employer it is from the employer's own source then it would be considered as the manufacturing cost that would be added and any payment which is demanded from the employee if employee pays any amount uh, towards the use of uh, such facility then perquisite would get reduced to that extent free concessional education facility value of the perquisite would be the expenditure actually incurred by the employer if the education institution is maintained and owned by the employer the value would be nil if the value of any fees per child is below rupees 1000 per month else the reasonable cost of such education is institutions in or near the locality so here an exemption of rupees 1000 per month per child is allowed then comes interest free and concessional loans the value of perquisite shall be the excess of interest payable at the prescribed interest rate over interest if actually paid by the employee if the interest cost to the employer is 10% and the loan is provided to you at 5% then the difference of 10 minus 5 would be treated as your perquisite the prescribed interest would be the rate charged by state bank of india if it is not possible to define the borrowings the prescribed interest rate would be the rate charged by state bank of india on the first day of the relevant previous year in which loan of the same time and so in purpose is advanced to the general public perquisite is calculated on the basis of the maximum amount outstanding monthly balance method however loans up to rupees 20000 loans for medical treatment specified in rules are exempt then comes value of free calls free meals if free meals is provided during working hours then it's not treated as perquisite otherwise the perquisite value in respect of free food and of course for the employee shall be the expenditure incurred by the employer value of gift or voucher some companies on some festival occasions give some gift vouchers or some discount vouchers or some token vouchers coupon vouchers to the employee the perquisite value in respect of any gift or voucher or token in lieu of which such gift may be received by the employee shall be the sum equivalent amount to the gift voucher or taken जो भी एक्सपेंडिचर कंपनी ने इनकर किया है टू परचेज दैट वाउचर इफ द वैल्यू ऑफ द गिफ्ट वाउचर इज से 20000 रुपीस देन 20000 बिकम्स योर परक्विजिट्स हाउएवर द देयर वुड बी नो परक्विजिट इफ द वैल्यू ऑफ सच गिफ्ट इज रुपीस 5000 सो पर ईयर यू कैन अवेल ए वाउचर गिफ्ट वाउचर और ए टोकन वाउचर ऑफ रुपीस 5000 फ्रॉम द कंपनी एंड इट वुड बी tax free similarly certain companies provide club membership the perquisite value in respect of amount paid or reimbursed to an employee against the expenditure incurred in a club by such employee shall be taken to be the amount incurred or reimbursed by the employer as reduced by any paid or required from the employee however if the expenditure is incurred exclusively for business purpose then this will not be treated as the perquisites otherwise the any amount spent or paid by the employer for the club for the expenses of the club 
would be treated as the perquisites however if the company has purchased the club membership the value of the purchase is not treated as the perquisites only the expenditure incurred is treated as the perquisite now comes sweet equity for sweet equity the fair market value of any specified security or sweet equity share being an equity share in a company on the date on which the option is exercised by the employee shall be determined as under if the shares are listed on a recognized stock exchange then fair market value shall be the opening average of opening closing price of the share on the date of exchange if share of the company is not listed then fair market value shall be the value of such share in the company as written by by merchant banker on a specified date so here when you exercise your option that date becomes relevant the fair market value of any specified security not being equity shares on the date on which the option is exercised by the employee shall be the such value as determined by a mature banker so if it is a listed then the prevailing price on the stock exchange will be the value if it is not listed then value would be as determined by the mature banker certain companies give movable assets for the use of the employee if it is laptop and computers then it's not treated as perquisite if is movable assets other than laptops and computers then 10% of the original cost of the asset if the asset is owned by the employer and if the asset is taken on the hire or rent then the hire charges or rent charges paid by the employer company is treated as the perquisite yeah yahan to chal gaya usme chalo kabhi jana hai na to fir ye to nahi hai Another is transfer of movable assets. If any movable asset is given is transferred to the employee, then it is also treated as a perquisite. For computers, laptop, and such electronic items, actual cost of asset less depreciation at fifty percent for each completed year of usage would be treated as a perquisite. So if it is the electronic items, and then depreciation would be calculated at 50% on reducing balance method and whatever be the value that would be treated considered as the perquisite same way if it is motor car then depreciation is calculated 20% and for other assets the depreciation is calculated 10% and then whatever be the we have to calculate the depreciation the reducing balance method for number of years of usage of that particular asset and then arrive at the value that value will be treated as the perquisite and if any amount is recovered from the employee then the perquisite value would be reduced to that extent another thing is medical facilities certain companies provide medical facilities so expenditure incurred or reimbursed by the employer for the medical treatment of the employee or his family family includes spouse children dependent parents brothers and sisters parents brothers and sisters should fall under the dependent category they should be dependent on the employee then only it is eligible in any of the hospital is not chargeable if hospital is maintained by the employer hospital is maintained by the government authority or any hospital approved by the government or hospital is approved by the commissioner so the medical expense medical facilities provided by the employer to the family of employee and employee would be become tax free however medical insurance premium paid or reimbursed by the employer is not chargeable to tax then the overpaid companies take medical insurance to the employee so it is not chargeable over 
any other expenditure in employer for putting milk in india chargeable to tax up to 15000 in aggregate per assessment year so there is a blanket exemption of rupees 15000 so which is available and it's not chargeable to tax to that extent so then comes medical facilities outside india so any expenditure which is incurred for medical treatment outside india is exempt to the extent permitted by rbi and expenditure incurred on travelling patient and one attendant is exempt if gross total income before incurred travel expense of the employee does not exceed 2 lakhs then comes the leave travel concessions this is very common the leave travel concession is a there is a block of 4 years you can claim two journeys in a block of 4 years the present block is of 2022 to 2025 and in case if an employee fails to get claim the exemptions in any of this block period of 4 years then he has got the flexibility to claim the amount in the next block first year of the next block so if the employee is the suppose fails to claim the exemptions in the 2022 2025 block then in the calendar year 2026 he can claim it for the previous block here what is allowed is only the fare either railway fare or train fare or bus fare and no other expenses are eligible for leave travel concessions then comes leave encashment there is a very big announcement in the present budget on the leave encashment earlier the maximum exemption amount for the leave encashment was 3 lakhs rupees the limit is increased from 3 lakhs to straight way 25 lakhs so leave encashment if it is received while you are in the service then it is fully chargeable then no exemptions is available if you claim the leave encashment while you are in the period of service while you are working but if it is claimed on your retirement then there will be two parts for government employee the entire amount becomes exempt and for other employees 10 month salary or 25 lakhs or actual leave encashment ratio the minimum of this would become exempt then we have got a pension pensions can be in two parts commuted pension and uncommuted pension uncommuted pension refers to the pension periodically received by the employee whereas commuted pension means lump sum amount taken by commuting the pension or part of the pension whereas employee commutes only a part of the pension and the pension rules the remaining amount will be periodically received by him so uncommuted pension is taxable as salary under section 15 in the hands of both government and non government employees and any computer commuted pension received by government employees is wholly exempt and for non government employee he can claim exemptions in two part there are two uh, clauses for that if the employee is in receipt of gratuity then one third amount of the commuted pension and if is not in receipt of gratuity then one half of the amount of the commuted pension then comes gratuity if gratuity is claimed or received while you are in the service then is taxable if it is received at the time of retirement or on death if you are government employee it is fully exempt and if you are other employee non government employee then there will be two parts one gratuity which is covered in the payment of gratuity act 
another gratuity would be which is not covered under the payment of gratuity act so the tax treatment will see the tax treatment of both the heads if gratuity is covered under the payment of gratuity act then there is a maximum limit of rupees 20 lakhs then you have to calculate 15 days salary for every completed years of service here for calculation of 15 days salary you need to divide your monthly salary by 26 days and not by 30 so you need to arrive at a monthly salary divide it by 26 that would be your per day salary then you divide that you multiply that amount by 15 days and for every completed year of service so minimum of these three would be tax exempt and if you are not covered by the gratuity act maximum amount remains at 20 lakhs but half month salary for every completed year of salaries would be exempt so with this i think uh, there is nothing more to add as far as income from salary is it concerns another aspect for salary is the deductions under chapter 6 which are very relevant but as we have got a separate and exclusive session on deductions under chapter 16 i am not taking these deductions right now and i have kept myself limited only to the extent of income from salaries deductions would be taken separately when there is a special designated session for that so if i think with this so i am through with my presentation on income under the head salaries as i said is very simple easy and uh, very small topic to start with so if you have got any other thing to add you are free Yes, sir. You can ask the question. Sanjeev Kumar, Banaji, sir. You can ask the question. You can unmute yourself and you can ask the question. Hello. tomorrow we have got very important topic on income from profits income from business and profession which will be very lengthy topic so uh, if you can uh, uh, go to your chat box just a moment huh? yeah yeah sure एक सेकंड ई टी फॉर पेंशन रिसोर्ड आफ्टर रिटायर रिटायरमेंट टैक्सेबल फैमिली पेंशन इज ट्रीटेड अंडर द हेड इनकम फ्रॉम अदर सैलरी अदर सोर्सेस Sweet equity share. Can you please repeat? Okay. See for sweet equity shares, 
we have to determine the fair market value of the security the fair market value of uh, any specified security or sweet equity shares will be the amount if it is a listed security then the prevailing price on the date on which the option is exercised by the employee otherwise it will be the amount which would be determined if it is not is not listed mostly it would be listed company only so it will be the prevailing price on the date of exercise the option on the stock exchange that would be considered as the fair market value of the equity how nri salary is to be treated so and if it is if any nri is uh, getting income in india then naturally all income is taxable for nri if nri is uh, earning is is settled abroad and is not taking any is, is income is not due or received in india then it's not taxable Uh, does pension received from epfo and superannuation by retired employee forms part of salary and standard deduction is available on epfo to my understanding uh, is treated as income from other sources i need to recheck but mostly it, it is treated as uh, ek minute the i need to recheck that ek second your standard deduction would be available you can claim standard deduction on for pension received from epfo and superannuation it would be treated as your uh, income under the head salaries and uh, standard deduction would be available yes both are part of salaries and uh, standard deduction is available yes sir but family pension is taxable under the income from other source no right right so there uh, you will have a different deduction from it no yeah family pension uh, is uh, along it is the... taxable as income from other sources income from other sources yes it is uh, family pension is income from other sources so it will not be part of salary right right so standard deduction will be applicable to uh, your second uh, what was the question super annuation yeah hello yeah yeah pension received from epfo pension received from epfo so it would be uh, under the head income from other sources yes 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 so it will be uh, it will not be part of salary yeah, yeah. it will not be one fifth then you have to go by deduction 57 yes. 15 or one third of the amount whichever is received mm, 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 mm. because as such there is no employer employee exists no A relationship yes, exists yeah, yeah, yeah. right ah uh, same way follow you can unmute yourself and you can ask the question yeah, my uh, i am confused on this point only yeah uh, because the uh, family pension is received from uh, epfo right and, uh, whatever my understanding is so we need a clarification uh, from you sir on this uh, 
anything received from superannuation pension and uh, epfo which is family pension continues to be part of salary for a retired employee also and standard deduction is available on it Thank all you. the pensions which are coming from say lic and other insurance policies which are privately taken are part of other income that is my understanding i need a clarification on let me recheck this confirmation yeah sir irrespective of the family pension whether received on superannuation or from epfo yeah if it is a family pension it needs to be taxed under the head income from other source right because once you ceases to be a employee so yeah then there is no then there is no relationship of employer employee right and the basic principle of taxation of any amount under their salaries is that you should have a employer employee relationship right what uh, correct me if i am wrong even when the uh, uh, itr1 or other forms are auto populated hmm. this comes as a part of uh, salary so that is why i am asking for a clarification no there must there may not be they are mentioning family pension there may be mentioning it is as a only pension so for retired employee what are the pension comes under salary pension is part of salary family pension is part of income from other source okay i'll check on that Sir, uh, employee receiving pension from EPFO is part of salary. I feel, and family yes. pension means after the employ the uh, retired employee's uh, death, uh, the spouse gets this family pension that yes. will be charged under income from other sources. That I is my correct view. Yeah. So family pension is income from other sources only. Yeah. Hello. fine i think it is it's correct that it is uh, income from other sources okay next any any other thing is there any sir other? sir sir hmm sir uh, just now i was searching uh, through the uh, ye yeah. does right. pension from a epfo qualify for standard deduction there mm -hmm. is a uh, there is news item in the economic times okay and in which they have mentioned that hmm uh, i will read it out as per section 87 of the it act you can claim tax rebate of rupees 12500 if you are a resident you are a, does not exceed 5 lakh if the uh is not eligible further the pension received from epfo is taxable under their salary and it will qualify for standard deduction however the maximum standard deduction 50000 which or is less ye ek write up mujhe mila hua hai economic times ka hai ye acha ek second
Thanks. Okay. Is this visible? My screen is visible. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. But uh, there, that is showing sweet equity. Then he takes one family pension is showing sweet equity. Uh, you will have to choose that particular file. Okay. Now it is coming? No. Yes, yes. Take some progress and it starts with the moment. Now I need to check up a cup guy cover. This is by uh, department only. This is with respect to family pension in case of deceased employee. Right. That is that is okay, sir. The, the question is whether EPFO pension is EPFO pension if if the employer uh, if the employee is in uh, employment and if okay. is, if employees are employed yeah. if he is in employment and because of his earlier employment if he has invested some amount in epfo through which he can he is getting the salary in okay. that uh, pension then in that case it will be taxed under the head uh, income from salary right but but if the epfo mm -hmm. pension on as a successor, as a successor to the deceased employee, if the family is receiving it, yeah, then it will be taxed okay. under the head income right. from income. other source. Right, right. Okay. Yes, yes. Clear. Okay, sir. One my uh, question is the error with respect to this honorarium part. Right. Uh, many uh, directors of the these cooperative banks uh, received uh, receive uh, some remuneration in the form of honorarium. Okay. And that is not a meager amount. It is quite a sumptuous amount. Right. So uh, the employer is uh, deducting tax on it under section 192. Okay. And uh, since there is as such no employer employee relationship. Yes. Exist between the uh, director and the that cooperative bank. Yes, I have no other option but to show it as a uh, part of salary. No, but if there is no, they are not the there is no uh, relationship of employer and employee. No, be between the director and the bank. Uh, then how will it be treated as a income from salary? They, they are, uh, for the purpose of uh, TDS provisions. Right. The applicability of 192 is there, irrespective of whether it is salary or if it is a continuous uh, payment of same amount, it amounts to salary. Okay, they are paying this regularly every month. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Fine. So, is there any? Uh, I had uh, taken the second opinion in this regard also, right. but uh, the uh, practitioner from Mumbai said it will be treated as a part of salary only. Right. Because since your income has been uh, subjected to the TDS under 192, right. It you have to offer it in the uh, income from salary only only. Right. Otherwise, I would have treated it as a, treated it as a uh, consultancy or 194J. Yeah, yes. yeah, it would have certainly helped me. 
साल का सर अगर मुझे लाख रुपए महीना अगर मिल रहा है तो बारह लाख रुपए का इनकम होता है राइट एब्सोल्युटली सैलरी के ऊपर बारह लाख के ऊपर टैक्स ज्यादा जाता है वेर एज इफ इफ आई शो इट एज ए इनकम फ्रॉम कंसल्टेंसी और प्रोफेशन देन आई कैन सर्टनली but as they are getting on a monthly basis just like uh, the salary uh -huh. yeah so that's why they would have treated as uh, yes yes, uh, yes working director sir one more question is there uh, as i was uh, uh, listening to you about the esop and that sweet uh, equity right. part of it right so uh, in many uh, cases uh, once the esop is uh, granted to the employee right on exercise of that granting of esop mm -hmm. the employee purchases those esop mm -hmm. at a certain rate right which is fmv okay granted price or say right and on that he pays the fbt also that is uh, perquisite uh, through fbt means fringe benefit tax uh, right. there so right. which is uh, straight away deducted uh, from the salary itself so mm -hmm. what will be my cost of acquisition when i sell those shares in the market so whether be whether it will be my granted price plus the plus the tax i have paid on it or the only the fair market value on which i have been granted that is so so they to calculate fringe benefit tax on the value of fmb yes they 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 charge you uh, for fbt right. in a portion of that granted price plus the market price as on the date of granting okay so that is the uh, perquisites that part is included in the perquisites right on that perquisites part they deduct the tds right as a part of salary itself they treat right. it as a salary and they accordingly deduct the tax okay so but that tax calculation is separately dedicated to that perquisite part only on which separate tax is calculated and paid right and deducted right. so when i sell that share in capital gain capital gain calculation what will be my cost of acquisition whether my fmb will be my granted price plus the cost uh, plus the tax i have paid on it i think its equity should be included otherwise it will amount to double taxation on that portion no ah huh. see you are only paid some tax on the difference and again you are paying the tax hmm. so equity should normally uh, be form part of that cost but i'm so this i'm this so my F, my fmv will be my mm -hmm. fmv will be market value as on the date of granting right okay cost of acquisition will be mm -hmm. my market value or as on the date of granting granted date right so instead of including that tax portion in that uh, granted price i will straight away take the fmv as the uh, rate at which at uh, rate and date on which i got the uh, that uh, esop yes rate for that particular date right market rate that will be right. my fmv cost of yes. acquisition right Sir, can you highlight some case studies or practical aspect related to salary for income from salary? So, if there is any specific uh, topic, then we can find out that. But there are no generalized uh, case study. Or oh, a yeah, practical, if anything, practical question, a part computation or like that, that will help. no if there is any particular subject topic on which you want uh, some yeah, specific income from salary on the i am talking when I, we are talking about the income ha, from salary, income salary if we can state. take that uh, for example hmm. we have discussed so many uh, provisions related to income from salary 
Right. So if you can uh, take the some practical aspect related to that, that will be beneficial for the members. I know we are professionally qualified. We know the thing, but sometimes it helps. No, I am not able to get clarity exactly what you are looking for. No, 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 now for study, various provision we have taken related to income right. from salary, for example, uh, that is uh, for uh, pension, LTA, all those things we have taken. Yeah, then it's uh, uh, rent uh, on house property, all those things, whatever we have selected. Hmm. We have no, I don't have any case study on that. Right no, no, case study, if it is practical aspect, any practical question type you can take. No, I don't have anything further to share. Ashish Pausar is there? Any coordinator? Yeah, yeah, can we? Yeah. yeah. Should we conclude the meeting if there is no further question? I don't have any further thing to share. Yeah, yeah. The CMA okay, can I ask? Okay. I wanted to ask one small question to Dakshash ji. Can I ask yeah. you, sir? Yeah, sure. You said there are a lot of earlier, if you remember, there are a lot of people who are the hmm. member of superannuation fund. Right. Okay. At the time of superannuation, what happens is a person who is superannuated from the company, hmm. what they what happens is one third portion they get as a uh, uh, you know lump sum commuted value. Commuted. Uh -huh, commuted. Two third amount uh, the LIC. Basically, it has been funded with the LIC or any other insurance company. The right. Two third amount they take an annuity. Right. Now, for all practical purposes, the person who are my clients, I treat this, yeah. tell those people, you take it as a salary. Will that be a, my stand will be correct or not? I, 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 you know, forget about the definition that it should be employer-employee relation. See, by if there would not have been employer-employee relation, LIC would not have paid me. Why they should pay me? It is not a something like a one-time premium which I have paid and I am getting annuity. I am getting because I was an employee of a company and after that, after I have retired, I, I, I got a uh, you know commuted value and two-third portion, the LIC took a value annuity instead of my employer takes, LIC take, took, you know, can that be treated as a salary? It's a very typical kind of thing. I am with a CIT appeal. Most probably right. I will get it. I, 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 I think I, I can... Uh, convince anybody about this and 99% I will succeed but still I would like to take an opinion on this opinion in a sense your views I'm not clear key whether it will be treated as a salary or not see uh -huh. I need to check whether any judgments uh, need to study any no there, there, from... there are no judgment people are saying it you should take as an inter income from other source but I always tell right. those people I always try to you know uh, put into this way argue in this way saying the right. other way I would not have got it it is, not something yeah. like, it is not something like that. I pay a one-time premium and I get that's a fine. So that is very, very clear. It is not a uh, it is not a salary. But this is because I was an employee of a company and the employer has right. taken out the this thing. I am getting that money. So what happens to that? Another portion which I was trying to tell those people now, any contribution mm -hmm. which you make to the super renovation fund excess of one lakh. In my, our time it was more than one lakh. Okay, mm -hmm. it's taxable. Okay, mm. now, now under that situation, they all they must always take this into account. So I 
think i will succeed but last last couple of years because of corona this you know mm-hmm. hearing is not c- coming up once once i have argued now they have kept it on hold let's I see what happens it should be a landmark judgment because normally it is treated as income from other sources only but i think mm-hmm. your argument is well taken if you yeah. succeed your argument your case is pending at tribunal level no 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 <laughs> cit appeal level the cit nowadays because mm-hmm. of my all practical experience nowadays cits are not giving any judgment He, they yeah. always they say you are going to go to tribunal why should i take that risk yeah absolutely <laughs> so so no cit is now but uh, finally but i was trying to tell those people you let department go they go into this now tribunal you allow me and let department go i have no problem <laughs> there is always you know condition yeah, with i go cit appeal will take such a bold view <laughs> they, they don't take now that is the biggest problem yeah. our our uh, our prison system is such a bad you know yeah become very difficult Absolutely. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Vinayagi, Vinayagi, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any yeah. any other question? I would like to thank C M S Lokshi sir for his excellent presentation and highlighting various aspect uh, provisions related to income from salary. I look. I would like to thank the W R C staff for their continuous support and uh, all the members who have attended this webinar. Thank you, sir. We have our our second session tomorrow from 5 p.m. So I will request you to join for tomorrow session on income tax. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Thank you so much.